started the recording. There we go. Should we let them all in? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Are we all in? Good afternoon, everybody. I think um, we've got a few people coming in, so I'll let Osbert press the buttons and hopefully we've got a number of people joining us. Welcome as you jump in. All right, I'm going to get started. We might have a few people kind of joining us, but just um, Thank you for joining us, everybody, to our Naturally Inspired Sustainability Leadership webinar on this very sunny day. Um, I, I apologise for bringing you in front of a computer, um, but um, yeah, welcome and thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, hopefully we'll have a really inspiring hour. Uh, so even if you're not uh, outside right now, you'll be inspired to go out and connect with nature um, when we finished. So this, this webinar is really all about our naturally inspired sustainability leadership approach uh, that we've been applying here in Plymouth. So before we start, just a couple of uh, housekeeping uh, just to let you know, we are recording the session uh, today and we will be sharing it after the event on our Green Minds website, uh, so you will be able to, to catch up. I'm afraid that as attendees, all your mics are muted, but hopefully you'll be able to access the chat function. So there should be a little um, kind of speech bubble uh, that's live, so uh, you should be able to please put in any questions or thoughts or, or ideas uh, as we um, as we go through, there will be a Q&A session after our speakers um, have shared uh, their slides today. So um, just to check, everybody can can see the chat. Uh, if you have you pop in, we have got uh, a little poll question just to um, to invite you to to join into to the Slido poll here, which is really um, just a quick yes no question uh, to get an idea of whether you all consider sustainability as part of your professional role. So uh, on the chat, just click in and you should be able to just um, answer uh, that poll there. So we'll just give you a couple of minutes to give that a go. Um, hopefully that will give time for the last stragglers to be joining us as well. Okay, so yeah, a few more people coming in. Brilliant. So it's nice to see we've got um, people from from Plymouth and and outside Plymouth today. Plymouth people from kind of education and community sectors as well. Um, so if you want to say anything in the chat just about where you where you're from today or um, what interests you, please please go ahead. It's always interesting to know, even if you can't speak. Who's here? That would be lovely. Okay, so I'm just going to um, just do a little bit of introduction on, on who's who's going to be speaking today. So just so you know, I'm Zoe Sydenham and um, I manage the uh, natural infrastructure projects team at Plymouth City Council. And we run a whole range of uh, both marine and terrestrial projects in the city, uh, working with a whole different range of partners and communities. And Green Minds is, is one of the um, great projects that we've got running at the moment. So uh, I'm just chairing the session today. I'm going to hand over to our three amazing speakers. Uh, so we have Gemma Sharman, who's got nearly 20 years experience managing projects, improving spaces for people and wildlife. And she's currently the programme lead for the Green Minds programme. And she's going to give an overview of, of the objectives of, of that program and we'll show a short video highlighting how um, the nature inspired leadership program came about. She's then going to hand over to Osbert Lancaster. So he's a director at Realize Earth and co-founder of the Sustainability Leadership Network. Uh, he's got over 20 years experience of supporting organizations and individuals to take action for sustainability and his work has been recognized by UNESCO for its contribution to learning for sustainability. 
and um, he's really kind of been been the, the guru, I'd say, and the mastermind for the Naturally Inspired Leadership Program. Um, we've worked really closely with him um, over the last year, and so he's going to be sharing an overview of the approach and also how that then applies to his work with the wider National Sustainability Leadership Network. And then thirdly, we have Karen Pilkington. We're delighted um, to have Karen, um, she, who participated in, in the Naturally Inspired Leadership Program. Karen is one of the founders and current director of the Village Hub in Plymouth, which focuses uh, on a community hub supporting residents to take action in their local neighborhood. Uh, this includes some recent projects like taking on a license to manage their local park for people and wildlife, growing and providing local food, um, arts engagement, skills development and supporting um, residents through um, the COVID challenges over the last couple of years. And to be fair, Karen is an all round force for good. Um, and um, so really, it's a pleasure to, to have her time because uh, she's a very busy lady. And uh, we've just been talking about, you know, how um, her role has developed, you know, building um, communities, uh, inclusive leadership with, with nature at its heart. So really pleased to have Karen here. OK, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Gemma to give you a little overview of the Green Minds programme. Hello, lovely to be with you all today. Um, as I said, I manage the Green Minds programme, which is an um, in ERDF funded uh, programme through the Urban Innovation Actions in Europe. And it's really about looking at um, finding uh, nature based solutions to a lot of our urban challenges. And Green Minds is really focused on rewilding people and places, essentially, in a nutshell. Um, I could spend a long time talking about it today and that's not really the point of today so I won't go into that now but um, we will pop our website in the chat there's our recent progress report on that website as well as the page all about um, our nature-based leadership program as well so you can find out a little bit more and, and delve into it a little bit after the webinar if you want to so please do have a look at that um, I just want to give a bit of context before we we hear from Osbert and Karen um, as part of Green Minds, we were really interested in um, how, how we support nature connection. We have a big theme around creating uh, green mindsets, as well as delivering urban rewilding on the ground. And by that, we wanted to look at you know, people that live in Plymouth, but also people that work in different sectors across Plymouth as well. So we were really interested in how we could support uh, more nature based decision making across different disciplines. Uh, and, and really explore what actually what that even means. So, so as we developed the nature-based leadership program as it was then, um, and engaging with uh, Realize Earth with, with with Osbert, we were really interested in how we could uh, bring together different sectors, uh, um, encourage people with different levels of uh, decision making uh, responsibility in the different organisations and sectors, and start to really explore. What, what does nature-based leadership mean? What the, does nature-based decision-making mean uh, for, for their work and, and personal lives as well? So the, the participants all, um, they self-selected, but did apply for the programme. Um, and we had a cohort of uh, 17 multidisciplinary professionals uh, that went through the six month programme, uh, co-facilitated with Green Minds and Realize Earth, um, who, as Zoe said, have you know, extensive expertise in sustainability leadership. Um, so to give a bit more background, we're going to show a little summary film that we've just put together, and then I'll, I'll hand over to Osbert, who's going to talk about actually the programme, the principles behind it, and actually what we did in practice. So hopefully my screen is going to share. I'm always nervous about this. Share my screen. Um, here we go. Hopefully you will hear the audio. So as part of our Green Minds programme, one of the elements we want to look at was how we can take decisions that support nature in our cities. And one way of looking at this was through a nature-based leadership programme. Why this came about was recognising the need for a much kind of deeper, more fundamental, emotional connection with nature. We wanted to look at bringing together professionals from across different disciplines, across different sectors, to explore that process, but then also to support them to take action in their lives, but also in their, their own professions as well. 
one of the things that has really come through this course is about the fact that nature is around us all the time and actually how do we take some of the learning and understanding from the way that we interact and use nature into our wider work. I've learnt some really surprising things. The course leadership has been fantastic and there's been some really interesting principles around leadership and, and what nature-based leadership for the 21st century looks like. But I think one of the key things for me has been around the networking, the other groups, the other people who've been um, part of the course and the organisations. And it feels as though there's a real momentum in Plymouth, particularly at the moment, around organisations and their focus around environmental sustainability. In the construction industry, I think we can be a little bit neglectful of nature and I just really hope that, that people will change how they think about that, how they approach it in delivery of construction projects. I hope to take learning from this course into my industry and, and influence how that happens. Well, I admit, I thought nature-based leadership, is that really for me? I definitely had some doubts there, but ultimately I did put my name forward and I'm really pleased that I was accepted. My perspective has shifted a little bit in terms of nature connection, not just being in nature, but how to connect with nature. And I think using that for my wellbeing work has really made a very big difference and I hope to continue that going forward as well. So we recognise that all the people on the course work within an urban environment and that was really important in terms of the practical nature of the project. We didn't think it was realistic or even necessary to take people out on a five day wilderness retreat. So we wanted to use the natural spaces that we have here in the city, bring people together to enjoy the nature connection you can get here locally and look at how that nature connection can inspire our sustainability leadership and, and others on that journey. Thank you. I hope hope that sound came through. Okay, it's a bit unnerving. You share your screen and you don't know. Oh gosh, hang on. Oh, sorry, another video popped up. I had to just have <laughs> some advert playing in my head. Um, yeah. So um, th and thank you to all. Uh, um, there are some participants on the call today as well. So thank you to to those people who who participated in that program and and in the video as well. So hopefully Gab, that sets a bit of context. And now I will hand over to Osbert to to share a bit more detail. Okay, so thank you. Um, yeah, so um, really good to see everyone here. And to um, as as I've started sharing my screen so that it's it's there and we can we don't get distracted by that later. Um, but as Zoe says, it's a bit distracting when everything sort of disappears on your screen and you don't know who you're talking to. But and we're here now. So yeah, uh, so naturally inspired sustainability leadership and. This really came about um, a couple of years ago, I suppose it must be now, when, when Zoe and Gemma approached me, um, because we've got experience of exactly what Zoe mentioned in that film of running five day, five, six day sort of wilderness retreats for people about around sustainability leadership. And absolutely, it was really clear very early on that A, there was a pandemic going on, so that wasn't going to work. And B, well, actually, was it was really relevant and necessary at this point. And we soon decided it wasn't, and we developed something else. Um, just in terms of a bit of sort of clarification of uh, sort of um, confusion around um, around the names we're using in the video, um, Sylvia and Gemma talked about nature-based leadership. Um, we've evolved that to talk, now we're talking about naturally inspired sustainability leadership. And we might come back to that in the Q and A or whatever later, if anyone's curious, but that's what we are. Now we're talking about naturally inspired sustainability leadership. So, um, as uh, somebody said in the introductions, I've been working in sustainability for around 20 years. And one of the things that I've, I've learned in that time um, is that the very great majority of um, successful and exciting and sort of groundbreaking um, programs that actually bring and activities and actions that bring about sustainability and bring communities and organizations and people with them they come about because the person or the people who's leading that, that piece of work is personally passionate and committed and really wants to make this happen because they believe it is really important and because they care about the state of the world. And one of the things I noticed over that time as well, which made me really frustrated, is that again and again and again, when projects and programs are written up as case studies, that the importance of the, 
of the people behind it actually really caring and being motivated and passionate was nearly always sort of papered over in some ways, if it was slightly embarrassing, and we shouldn't really talk about that sort of um, that stuff, we shouldn't talk about this emotional stuff. And so the case studies in, get, uh, ended up with, you know, lists of, um, of actions and strategies and approaches and stuff, which were really dry, and very often, they often have some good stuff in them, but far too often people tried to apply them when they didn't really understand, the, you know, and weren't really, weren't really able to tap into their emotional and sort of psychological concept, um, and concerns and, and, and cares around, around sustainability and, and, and the climate and nature crisis. So that's one of the things we're really trying to do with, you know, with, with the Nature Naturally Inspired Leadership Program is to bring that right into the program. And there's another reason for doing that, which is that we all know, all of us here know that you know, the nature and climate crisis and all the well-being issues which are wrapped around all of that as well, you know, is the is one of the greatest challenges humanity's ever faced. And it often feels like sort of almost the only people who are actually sort of empowered or are supposed to do anything about it are people who've got sustainability in their job title, whether they're environment, manager or environment managers or sustainability directors or climate managers, or whether they're sort of official activists in NGOs or officially on a campaign or whatever. But what about the rest of us? And uh, there's this huge, great majority of people who are who care deeply who are worried and are concerned and want to do something and have a have a whole range of skills and experience and connections and positions of authority and agency in their organizations where if they're given permission or feel they can just take that permission they can be really effective agents of change and that's what's behind my work and has increasingly become behind my work in the last three four years is focusing on that significantly large group of people who are ready and willing to take action and just need that permission and some support to do that. And that is again is behind the Naturally Inspired Leadership Leadership Programme. So to tell, and what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about the background to it and how it works. I'm not going to sort of obviously try and do a condensed version of the, 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 the programme, which is of the always, always the temptation. So I'm going to just stop not avoid doing that, but we'll see what we get to. And you might have some questions um, in the Q&A bit. So these, this piece of work, this, this program is based around three, what we call three realities. And the first of these realities is that basically we are part of nature. You know, evolutionarily, scientifically, there's no, no question of it, we are part of nature. But our culture, Western culture in particular, but our culture leads us to think and behave as if we were separate from and in control of the rest of the living world. And that is the fundamental problem that is actually at the root of so much of the climate crisis and the nature crisis, is that essentially that disconnect between the reality and, 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 and the way in which you're thinking and behaving. And the solution, part of the solution, but the key part of the solution is actually to develop and redevelop a strong sense of nature connectedness, or ugly, clunky term academics talk about, but nature connectedness the sense that we are, we are emotionally and psychologically feel part of nature, not just that we understand that we depend on it, which is both important as well, but a fundamentally sort of different level of depth and connection. It, it matters to us because we are part of it. It's like cutting off our arm, right? If we, if we, if we are damaging nature, it's not just, oh, if we do that, we'll have a bit less clean water or, or whatever. Ecosystem services, useful concept, but not the same as nature connectedness. And so that's one of the one of the one of the founding sort of principles around this is this working we to so be exploring this what the reality of that we are part of nature what does that mean? The second reality is that humans are naturally kind and caring. There's a huge amount of research showing that, that is the case, but our culture yet again actually sort of assumes that people are selfish, that people are motivated primarily by self-interest. And that they and that that's the really the only way in which we can get people doing anything, whether that's for sustainability or for well-being or for equalities or whatever. We can only do that by appealing to people's selfish self-interest. And if we do that, we're essentially endlessly reinforcing that the worst of human nature, because all of us have in us, we all of us have a values of kindness and caring, and we also have values which are perfectly legitimate of 
looking after ourselves and looking after our close family first. They're all the part of our natural innate values, but our society, our culture has got them out of sync by this continual reinforcing with this vicious circle of continually reinforcing these selfish values. And that is having a fundamental problem in the way in which we, um, we interact with each other and with the natural environment. And the solution to this, we strongly believe, is to actually engage and encourage people's innate kindness and their care for each other and for other living things and, and, and the world in general. And also, this is a slightly subtle point that we'll get into perhaps, you know, get into in the, in, if you went uh, in the guide we can share later, but it's also really important to raise awareness that most people are kind and caring because that's what the research shows, even though most people don't believe it. It's like everyone is an above average driver. Everyone thinks that I'm kind and caring, but most other people aren't. And that's got a whole lot of problems, which I won't go into just now. So the third reality, this comes back to where I started. All of us, all of us have the capacity to help create a better world. But again, our culture tells us that actually, unless it's in our job description, or unless we decide to be sort of an official activist and climb, you know, climb pylons or whatever, or you know, glue ourselves to to to, um, to to doors and things. Unless we're doing that, it's not really anything up to us. It's like all we can do is deal with sustainability in our private lives. We can do green consumerism. We can support campaigns. We can vote for people. But apart from that, it's not really much to do with us. And but actually, the solution to that problem is that well, actually no, that's not that's not the case. You know, we need we can we once we know more about how change happens, how we can influence change, and how we can sort of help steer and direct change in helpful directions, all of us can actually be agents of change for sustainability in our work, in our broader professional lives. And if more of us are doing that with you know, helping create a, a sea change, helping create that transformation, and indeed really supporting and being allies to those people who it is, it is their official job to do this, the sustainability managers and the climate change directors and so on, all of whom are absolutely desperate and struggling to engage other people in their organizations. But they're also, the other people are being told by their job descriptions, it's not really for you. So we can, we can all work together on this by bringing those three things together. So that's sort of our underlying philosophy, um, which and as we, and so I'll take you now into a little bit into how the program actually worked, what we actually did together. So there were three key elements to the program. And the first of them was sort of understanding these realities. So essentially a course, classes, workshops, discussions, readings, slides, all that sort of stuff, exploring what are these, what are these three realities? You know, what's going on there? Looking at some of the psychology and some of the science behind, behind those realities. And but like in so many courses and programs you get one goes on, it's like, here's all this stuff you need to understand. And maybe here's some tips as to what you're going to do with you, could, you could do with it if you went off and did something. We wanted to go beyond that. And that was we actually worked in the program with the participants and actually supported them through working in small groups together to actually start working out, well, what specifically could they do in their organizations, in their work? based on not just on the list of everything you could do, but looking at their own particular circumstances. What sort of organization were they in? What level of authority and agency did they have to influence others? What were they already doing that they could build on? What were the specific pieces of work they were doing where they could weave this into it? So really trying to help people sort of create a tailored Action plan sounds so naff and boring, but it was, I suppose it was an action plan in a sense, but it's trying to create something which is really relevant to them, but not an action plan in the sense of a long list of, you know, a plan to the future of everything we're going to do in the next six months. It was more like, okay, where should we focus our energies and what are we going to, where shall we start doing that? What are the first steps you're going to take? Start, start working with that. And that leads us on to the third element of the program, which was supporting participants to take the take those actions take those steps they've identified and essentially essentially sort of an action learning approach working out what you're going to do 
trying some stuff, seeing what worked, learning from that, trying something else, learning from that, and providing a space through that action learning uh, approach of having um, working, having uh, holding small group discussions and what we called action learning sets, where people could actually the participants could come together and give each other support and feedback around their plans and around what was working, what wasn't working, how they could do that differently, holding each other accountable to a certain extent, and sharing ideas and inspiration around that. So those were the three three key elements of the program which if I remember rightly took place over around, I think it was about six months overall with, with Christmas and New Year in the middle giving us a bit of a break. So that was the broad, that was the, that was the, um, the key elements. Threes are obviously a theme here, but three elements of our approach was that I, again, I hinted at earlier, was this thing about connecting the personal and professional. So often we're told either we're being we're in a sort of personal space and that's one thing, or we're in a professional space, we're wearing the suit, we're working to the job description and never the twain shall meet. This is about recognizing actually as individuals, we care about what's going on in the world, we care about other people, and that ought to and needs to be part of our professional life, explicitly bringing that together and creating the conversations where people can actually start exploring that because it's not always easy it's not easy it's not a case of just rolling up and starting to share everything at the, at the board meeting so how does that work in practice exploring that together and that leads us on to the next bit building community through deep communications deep conversations and you heard in the film someone there saying you know the, with this importance that, that that community that was developed and these deep connections of the people that was partly came about through two, in two different ways really one of them was just through the conversations we created, both in the online workshops and in the action learning sets, but also the conversations that happened in the um, outdoor um, outdoor workshops and activities, which Gemma and Gemma and Zoe, with the help of other participants in the program, led led in Plymouth, and that was a really important aspect of this, with this outdoor element, um, for for obvious reasons, given the given the subject matter. But I was in Edinburgh. They were in Plymouth, so we, we worked that between us. And then, as I've already hinted at, um, the third approach here, what part of the approach was this thing around action learning, the action learning process, and helping people develop the experience and the skills and giving them some resources and tools to keep on applying the action learning process as, as they went forward with this work. And finally, I just want to close by sort of highlighting um, this the bigger element of which this particular naturally inspired sustainability leadership program was a part, um, is that at the same time as um, we were running the, the, the program, we were also developing and launching the sustainability leadership network, which Realize Earth um, hosts and, and, and I'm one of the co-founders of. And so the aim of the sustainability leadership program is for exactly those people I've you know, met, mentioned all the way through, people who have are working um, that don't necessarily have sustainability in their job description, but they're concerned and passionate and want to bring this into their working life. That's who the network is for. And it does that through, uh, we, we support them by creating connections between people, by providing a platform for online discussions and online courses and providing um, ongoing, ongoing support to people. So that was happening as well. And what we did was we put, we essentially sort of nested the sustainable, the naturally inspired leadership program within the sustainability leadership network. And what that meant, apart from just giving us a convenient online learning platform, more importantly than that, it meant that the participants weren't just the, the sort of bubble of activity in Plymouth, they were also part of this wider, wider international group of people who were also working on similar, on similar approaches in very, often in very different contexts. Um, but the opportunity to connect with other members of that network uh, even, you know, and either where people have got sort of similar interests but in another part of the world or another part of the country or people who are actually in a very different industry or sector but had interesting ideas and you know, inspiration and stuff to share, so the opportunity for cross fertilization. And the participants in the program have ongoing support, on ongoing access to the network for another six months after the end of the end of the that, that's sort of six months of the, the taught part of the program. 
that's continuing and they continue to engage and, and support each other both directly but also also through the through the network and yeah that's then the final thing I need to say is I'm not going to share these slides because they won't actually mean very much as they are at the moment um, but we are we have been working on a uh, on a guide to the whole program and the philosophy and the approach and the detail behind that it's not quite ready but we do have a draft um, so we'll share the draft with you I'll put a link in the chat um, shortly um, so we were in two minds as to whether we should share it but we thought well let's share it I, I put my foot down basically and Gemma's did okay I said well let's share it give people a chance to see something and you can you know take something away from this this webinar and the opportunity then for you to give us any thoughts on it and share you know, share share your thoughts and uh, any and uh, you know any 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 ideas that you have around that and as soon as the, the final version is available which will have some more case study or have some case studies and things in it we'll share that with you as well and that's all i wanted to say so it's now back to whoever is sharing the next bit and i'll stop sharing my screen thank you osbert that was a really great overview I felt like I was kind of going back in time, so that was really nice. Um, just to remind people, if you want to pop in, if you're anything like me, you'll forget your question <laughs> five minutes later. So if you want to pop into the chat any questions that, that come to mind or thoughts um, as you're hearing from the speakers, just, just pop something in the chat. I'm afraid you are all on mute, but um, we'll come to a Q&A after our next speaker. And just out of interest, thank you for to those of you who completed the poll. It's interesting, based on what Osbert was saying, that 91% uh, of you um, here today who completed the poll do think that sustainability is part of your, your role. So um, that's an interesting uh, point, I guess, to think about how we, how we reach out to a broader audience. So I'm now going to hand over to Karen Pilkington, who was a participant on the programme and is doing some amazing work uh, in uh, Stoke and Morristown in Plymouth, and is going to share a little bit about that with us. Karen, over to you. Lovely. Um, Gemma, are you able to share yeah. those slides just as I speak? Because okay. then that way, I otherwise I'll forget to push buttons. Yeah. Um, so thanks ever so much. <laughs> really nice to meet you all. Um, I applied for the programme um, mainly because um, I'm a fan of the Blockhouse Park. The Blockhouse Park is a, a kind of small urban park in Plymouth, pretty neglected, um, which is good for a rewilding um, point of view and kind of bad for a kind of awareness point of view because there's always there was always a danger that somebody might just start to encroach on the land with building. Um, and I really wanted to put the Blockhouse Park, park on the map of Plymouth and go, hey, we're beautiful, come and see us. So um, that's kind of why I applied. I was also quite interested in that kind of breaking down of different organisations. I'm not a um, like an appointed leader. I don't have letters um, after my name or anything or kind of a big long title. Um, so I used to get a bit of... Um, you know, like um, like a, a, a kind of fear of why am I even in the room kind of thing. But I, I was interested in connecting with lots of different other organisations um, who were doing different things who I, I would not normally have, have had a chance to get to know. So I really liked the mix of people in that um, first cohort. Um, and I've learned loads from different people's point of views and their jobs and what they actually do. Um, and, and, and yeah, I think as an emerging organization, the, the Village Hub were, um, um, were just really hungry. We, we were really hungry to know more and to kind of see what was going on and what was Green Minds all about. And, you know, so we're just kind of curious, really. I've got- Karen, really... sorry, Karen, can, Karen, can I stop you for one minute? And ask Gemma to make your slides play because they're very small on our screens at the moment. Oh. You need to make the press, you need to press play or whatever, it shows slides. I did press, oh, I did, hang on. <laughs> it looks big on mine, hang on. So we're just Are seeing not... a slide in the middle oh. of the screen. Oh. Yeah, sorry, on mine it looks like I'm sharing the whole thing. Let's try again. Even if you can't do that, maybe you can make the slide bigger. In the in the window, then we can see it, even if it's not officially playing. I know playing yeah. sometimes does weird things to to zoom. Yeah, I do. Sometimes we do have problems with zoom. I'm going to try my entire screen and see if that. Um, sorry about this. Let's see if this. 
That's it. Yay. Okay, that's <laughs> Thanks, Gemma. That's lovely. Right. Thanks, Osborne. Um, so what did I get out of it, I suppose, really? Um, I think some of the, 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 the real interesting things that I thought about were just um, that ability to slow down. Um, I think one of our first face-to-face -face sessions um, in the middle of the pandemic, which was really beautiful, was just taking time to walk around Saltram, take your shoes off, feel the earth. And there was just a real sense of kind of slowing down all the buzziness of, um, you know, how are we going to get out of the pandemic and what are we going to do next? And, and a little bit of a focus. And I think that was a kind of key thing for me as I began to kind of connect up with nature in a deeper way myself really um and that would have read and that started to open up my mind i think to i suppose new and interesting ways of thinking so what osbert was saying about that kind of we're fundamentally kind as people and yet we also think that other people are fundamentally you know unkind how does that work in communities um, was thinking about um, like that action planning thing helped me think what are the most important things that I could do now that are achievable and attainable. Um, that was really interesting actually at Osbuck because I think my first action plan, I just like ditched it and started to have a second action plan as, as, as the conversation developed and as I, I was able to sort of dip in and out of some different kind of thinking. And, um, and then really started to think about other people's experiences be, be, because of that sort of shared relationship and those deeper conversations, thinking about what was happening in education, what was happening um, in people who were managing services uh, and what was happening in like small businesses and how those different sectors of our society were thinking about the climate and how the climate was impacting them and how the environment was impacting them. Uh, and realizing that well, there were way more similarities than differences. I mean, that's probably blindingly obvious when you talk to people, but I think it's actually really important as how we kind of move forward collectively. And so what I'm doing differently now, um, I feel like I'm not a botanist, I'm, I'm not a zoologist, um, I don't have much um, like education around the environment, but I really feel that I've been much more deeply impacted and much more aware of the little things that I can do that make a genuine difference. And I've got a much better language of how to communicate that into my community. So our community is, a, is pretty diverse in Stoke and Morristown. Um, we do have areas of high um, deprivation and all, all, all that kind of thing, um, maybe low education, um, a lot of a left behind kind of feel, shed load of people who would have voted for Brexit and all sorts of terrifying things. Um, so, so that's kind of our community. So therefore our attitudes as a community towards sustainability are really quite diverse. And I think what we're learning is rather than polarize that conversation between people who are, you know, just going, unless you do this, the planet's going to die. And then people who go, oh, perhaps it's a conspiracy theory anyway, and all of the bits in between that, rather than try and get involved in kind of angrily fighting out the debate, we're learning ways to really start to drip environmental practice into our day-to-day -day conversations and our day-to-day our -day interactions with people um, and you know thinking about why you should be turning your lights off thinking about um, the park thinking about the environment we have thinking about what's important in the park is it important to have flower beds or is it important to have loads of um, different types of grasses and did you know there even were loads of different grasses rather than just one and there's just been this kind of bubbling up of like lots and lots and lots and lots of different um, ideas and conversations um, in this beautiful organic way. And that's probably my biggest takeaway from this and my kind of like light bulb moment is that when you go into a beautiful copse or, you know, um, little bit of environment, 
that hasn't started because you know one dominant tree has just kind of landed there and then decided to create this environment around it and sort of strategized where the primroses went and when they turned up and all that kind of thing it was it was that that beautiful environment has been created with like you know hundreds of little things just kind of moving in accidentally and then beginning to have relationships with each other and little bits of symbiosis and all that sort of stuff that's just kind of happening uh, like underneath our feet over time you know not in a you know a three-point plan or a 12-month program um and that's what starts to create those really beautiful ecologies and i suppose that's what we've taken away as a kind of community building program that actually communities can build in similar ways they don't have to have you know top-down approaches they they don't have to have this kind of um like artificial plan we can afford to go slowly we, we we can afford to have seasons when we're not maybe doing very much at all but there's stuff bubbling under we can afford to have seasons where there's sudden like masses of growth and we all feel a little bit yeah oh, i'm aware of what's happening next and because we know we're going to go into a bit of a fallower season as we move forward and and that I think has been really helpful for the way that we're starting to think about communities growing alongside um, nature growing with, within our within the place that we live. Um, and if that's of any help to anybody on the call, then that's great. Um, feel free to contact me. Um, I'm sure Gemma will stick some details in there. You've got a website and ways to say hello. So that's me. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. It's um, you're doing amazing work, and it, it's really moving to hear and and inspiring to see actually going out um to the area where you live and work and and seeing those conversations uh, happening. And I think for me, what's really interesting is the role of of our public um, natural spaces in facilitating mm -hmm. those conversations, particularly in in the last two years. You know, they've proved such valuable spaces where people have felt comfortable mm -hmm. to come together. Um, and, and I really love the way that um, you talk about those conversations in a sort of ecosystem mm. uh, way, which is um, which is really lovely. So we're opening the floor really now to to any questions that you guys might have. As I said, um, unfortunately, you are you are on on mute. I'm not sure I have any control over that, but um, but there is an, an an option to put some questions that you might have uh, into the chat. I can't see any there at the moment. I'm not sure if um, any of our other speakers, Gemma or Osbert, want to add anything to uh, after Karen's. I would just talk. like to add, I think, how yeah, how lovely it is to hear of that. Not 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 spoken to you for a while. But it's lovely to hear all that all that progress, and particularly I just love all those those ecological metaphors that are just like rolling out of you in every single conversation. So that's great, um, and yeah, I think um, yeah, if we if we don't have a whole raft of questions queuing up in the chat you know, people people can unmute themselves so if you'd rather just i think probably unmute yourself and ask a question go for it hi uh, ian poiser from uh, college of Plymouth. can you hear me faintly hello we can just hear you it's just quite quiet you carry on hi there um yeah just uh just a question on is there any kind of case studies of uh, how this um, programs being applied to maybe uh, senior management teams within organisations and businesses, and um, and uh, what the kind of impact has been. Uh, maybe thinking about the implementation of uh, a sustainability strategy or a net zero sub strategy of some kind. Um, and uh, yeah, just whether there's any kind of case studies out there that, or personal experiences that you've had. Thank you, Ian. Yeah, so um, I, I mean, I, I'll start and probably hand over. Um, in terms of Plymouth perspective, certainly, I think when we opened the um, the program, uh, we definitely uh, were we had we were oversubscribed for <laughs> the numbers that we could take in, and we we definitely we had a really high high caliber of people applying. And we were definitely looking for people who who had some kind of responsibility over an, over an area of work in, in their role. So potentially um, could influence um, kind of strategy and policy. So I would say that um, 
again, as also we had quite a breadth of people from different sectors. So we are now the, the kind of programs coming to an end, um, looking at how we develop some of bring some of those case studies to the fore. So how those people have influenced strategy, policy, or, or senior decision making within their organisations. Um, and I and I think um, you know certainly within within the council um, again pulling together some of these um, some of these case studies in the Green Minds report is proving a really useful tool to have different kinds of conversations both with our um, our political uh, leaders and um, and senior decision makers and I guess we're also using the Environment Act. As a, as a lever as that develops and the obligations um, for us as a local authority uh, come out of that. It's an opportunity to sort of, um, to make it real. So, you know, it's not just a piece of policy, but actually what does this mean on the ground? So we're trying to um, to use that as a lever really, but uh, I'd say that it's it's kind of developing in terms of Plymouth. I think Osbert may well have some examples um, kind of nationally where he's worked with a national um, context, but um, but in Plymouth, I, this isn't it's not over yet. I think we're hoping to start a movement. So yes, how do we how do we bring more people into this um, this type of work is really important. Yeah. So I think. Um... In terms of sort of case studies, I think in terms of the, this particular program, you know, because as Karen said, it's, you know, this is one of the realities of the way that, you know, change happens in an organic sort of process. We can't necessarily control it. And I think it is, it is quite a challenge for people who are used to strategies and plans and mission statements to actually sort of translate, well, how do we do this in a different way? How do we actually start creating the conditions for the good stuff to happen rather than trying to sort of, you know, force it all um, you know, in, in, in a sort of a very conventional sort of change management process. So it, it is a challenge. Um, but I do reflect though on some work I did a few years back in a sort of different, a different more of a consultancy type project, but similar sort of approaches underlying it, which was with um, Edinburgh University and uh, helping them develop their first sustainability strategy. And that's where we took the senior management and the senior academics from thinking about sustainability if they even thought about it at all from seeing sustainability as being a responsibility of estates it being about carbon emissions from heating and lighting and being about food waste from the canteens to recognizing that actually that sustainability and social responsibility was something that was actually really important to them as people and that the university's biggest impact by far was not what happened on the estates important though that was in setting an example and so on but their biggest impact was what they taught and how they taught it to their students and how those students went out and did stuff in the world and the result of that work was they created a department a department of social responsibility and sustainability which has now been taking that work forward and building lots of stuff happening within the university but one of the bizarre things with that was that I found that I was really sort of, in terms of workshops and discussions with people, we were really getting stuck by using the word sustainability. People just weren't engaging with it. We were, the brief was around, my brief was sustainability and social responsibility strategy, and it wasn't going anywhere. What changed it around was when I was leading a workshop and I was getting up tired and um, <laughs> losing it a little bit and my sort of tongue slipped. And I, I talked about social responsibility and sustainability. And just that switch, people are going, oh, I get that, because social responsibility means something. And it's not about carbon emissions and stuff, because obviously we want to, I want to be a responsible academic, a responsible manager. Obviously, we should be a responsible university. So I think the point here is that when you can tap into what is really something that's meaningful for people at a personal level and to make sense to them logically, regardless of what the duties on public bodies and so on are, Though they're useful levers, that I think can then unleash enthusiasm and help drive things forward because you can make those connections between people's personal motivations and the organizational objectives, which maybe need some tweaking in terms of language. But taking the Edinburgh University from saying, since the Enlightenment, we've been doing wonderful things and changing the world, to saying, there's a, there's a global crisis and we can help solve it. That's been the jump they've made. That's fascinating, Osbert, actually. <laughs> um, in fact, uh, I'm probably going to go back to our 
recently drafted sustainability strategy and um, front load it with social responsibility. <laughs> 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 uh, um, I, I've spent a lot of time in boardrooms, um, very boring places. <laughs> it's often very disconnected from actually what's going on on the ground sometimes. Um, I don't think British business has, you know, evolved that much in the last 20, 30 years. Um, and, and, you know, I'm looking for ways in which we can kind of connect senior people within organisations more with, um, as you've just said, around that kind of, it's our responsibility, it's I actually do, they do care, um, you'd hope, <laughs> uh, and, um, and that they're more invested in some of the decisions that are being made within an organization and how that's implemented on the ground as well. Um, whether that's kind of being involved in developing a, a, some form of strategy or whether it's actually in delivering it, it, it you know, um, it's just make, making sure that connection rather than just a board being a, a decision-making process and a sign-off process. Uh, um, so, I'm, so I'm really fascinated. Uh, have, a, have a look. Have a look at the guide. I'll give you a, some mm. pointers. We'd like, you know, love, love to have a conversation. And see, see where, see where, where that gets to. I noticed yeah. Jord Jord Jordana, you had a, you're giving a thumbs up. Was that a request to um, ask a question? Um, I was giving a thumbs up to switching around sustainability. And oh, so I see. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, because I literally just made a note of that. It's yeah, it's really interesting the kind of connection between psychology and um, you know other parts of it, and it's it was really great that's been acknowledged now. Like you said at the beginning, rather than it's sort of being pushed away, it is that sort of passionate people that can make all the difference in the organisation, and it's a really good way of looking at it that everyone can play their part, whatever um, whatever position they have. Um, I'm interested um, because we, we've uh, just um, taken on a space um, called, we're called it Grow. We also um, have a space in Hackney, London called Grow, and uh, we cross over hospitality and sort of culture at a grassroots level. And the sustainability angle of it is at the very root of it. Um, but luckily we can, hopefully, we certainly not yet in Plymouth, but in Hackney sustain ourselves economically by selling sustainable products. Um, and diverting money away into away from multinationals who also do damage in their in their own right so you know taking money from the customer putting it back on good events with uh, good quality drinks and also taking money away from uh, the uh, um multinationals so yeah it's it's kind of embedding it from the very beginning um and uh, trying to sort of incorporate it all through you know hospitality there's a lot of work as an industry that we could do um to, to improve things so i'm just yeah it's really interesting Thank you. I didn't plan to say that much, but I'm glad I got it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Cool. Anyway, thank you. Yeah. Any any other questions for Gemma? I think is going to somewhat Gemma or Zoe is going to wrap up, but any other questions at this point? Miriam, you're unmuting. Yeah, I was just saying when you say sustainability, I mean I've been doing about it in um through my degree course. I've finished now, but um there was it's the economic social and environmental and it's that sweet spot but a lot of people just it's a word that's been bandied around along with lots of others and yeah it kind of becomes uh, meaningless and to, unless it's properly defined so that's that's another thing isn't it yeah, I think sustainability is a, it's a horrible word in lots of ways, as you say, it become, becomes yeah. meaningless and certainly we use it because it, people think they know what it means, it's a way of starting mm. a conversation. Yeah. I think when you're starting to work with, with communities, when you're starting to work with, with board members, whether you're starting to work with, mm. with colleagues and, and so on, then actually it often isn't a great place to start the conversation. Yeah. Um, and it's about, for me, it's about, you know, you know, our approach is about, well, what is it that people actually already care about? which is bound to be some part of sustainability yeah. and using that as a way into conversations and going mm. deeper. And so, yeah, I'd be, I'd be really cautious about using the word sustainability, yeah. in, you know, in, uh, in lots and lots of contexts. Yeah. Battery's gone low. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, just before we sum up, if I could just talk really briefly about what Jordan was talking about, the psychology and what Ian was mentioning. I think really often, Ian, you get, um, you know, people think they can make like pat decisions, like pat answers. So they say, there's the problem. That's how we're going to fix it. And that's very often how you get your board culture to work. 
And that's, but actually the whole point of this program, so it's quite challenging for that way of thinking because it starts to, um, um, it starts to ask deeper questions and put people, so, so, so you can't come out with those pat answers. So it's a little bit like a, like a action research kind of psychology where, where you're, you're pulling away from those kind of quick sound bites and say, oh, if we do this, this and this job done and sorted, because actually that's not really that useful and um and it just creates um like silo thinking i suppose and 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 it won't ever drip down the enthusiasm and the passion that individuals have so so the program challenges that and brings in quite a lot of psychology about how to kind of take your thinking from being kind of you know, like that in into widening up and asking questions and slowing down a bit and thinking a bit more. And that's one of the things that I find really useful and I think possibly is really useful for boards and senior leaders and people like that. So I think you have to try and get them into courses like this um, sort of um, slightly sneakily <laughs> so they don't realise what they're going to be taking on and then get them to commit into that way of being challenged. That's uh, really useful. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. I sort of had that, um, I started to introduce a concept around like donuts economics like earlier this year, quite sort of subtly in our early sustainability meetings. I'm a bit nervous about saying sustainability now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, so I think there's there's an extra step I think we need to do. Um, so uh, like many organisations need to go through. So um, yeah, really appreciate. And, and congratulations on completing the course. It sounds like it was really worthwhile. So. Um, thank you all for those, uh, those questions. It, it does really provoke a lot of thought. And I think having Kind of both participated and facilitated the program with Zoe and Osbert. Um, I think we we can also say you know we've kind of learned a lot about our own approach, kind of thinking, um, kind of relationship with the wider natural environment as well. Um, I just wanted there are a couple of questions that we're talking about. You know, are we running another program? Uh, what else is happening? So before um, we finish up, um, we just wanted to share some of the, kind of the opportunities to engage further. Um, as Osbert said, there's um, draft resource in, in development that um, has come out of the course. So please do have a look at that. Um, we'll be obviously finalizing that um, and putting out some case studies as well. So please have a look at that and have a, and, and we'd welcome your feedback on that as Osbert, Osbert said, if, if that makes sense, if that's, if that's useful, helpful. Um, so please do um, follow up on that. Um, we are talking about what, what we might do next. We have a cohort of people in Plymouth um, who have built relationships and networks and how do we continue to support that and this naturally inspired leadership um, uh, that this approach that we've been working on and whether that's looking at some shorter courses in the autumn um, because we recognise six months it was a big time commitment from people uh, so there's benefits to that having that kind of time to do that deeper work and build relationships but also uh, recognising that yeah is that is that realistic uh, so we're just starting to think about what we could do with that and, and whether we actually we could build these elements into existing leadership courses for us for, for us in Plymouth um, and other and other programs that already exist out there um, like you said so we can um, start to drip feed this these, these different ideas and and um, ways of approaching our, our sustainability work work with the environment whatever we want to call it um, uh, so so we will be looking to do that so so do keep an eye on our website the Green Minds website um, and and we will stay in touch as well um, the other thing I wanted to highlight, um, I'll, I'll let Osbert talk a bit about a couple of things he's he's got on in terms of future workshops and the sustainability leadership network. But um, the other point, and Karen really drew this, uh, uh, sort of drew attention to this and brought it to life, was actually it, it doesn't have to be about big, huge changes, radical changes. It can be small steps, you know, everything from holding a meeting outside and having a different conversation to just looking at, yeah, the terminology we use already. So, you know, these, this doesn't, it's not always about having to join a program, you know, completely transform your organization. It's actually just putting small actions into practice and starting to build different ways of seeing and, and, and viewing the world as well. And hopefully some of the case studies we'll share will, will um, highlight that as well. Um, so I didn't know, Oswald, if you just wanted to say a bit about some of the um, the kind of change maker workshops that you're working on and, and your network as well. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as I mentioned before, we've got the sustainability leadership network um, for people who are 
not, not who aren't necessarily got sustainability in their in their job title. Many of the members have, but we're very oh, very open. Like one of the few networks is actively seeking to support people who don't have it in their job description and are looking to looking to work with it. Um, but it is it is open to anyone who's in that sort of that sort of got a role where they've got some sort of you know professional responsibility, leadership responsibility, some sort of agency to make change happen in their organisation, or want and want to either are doing that or want to start doing that and find out how they can. So the sustainability leadership network is available, and I've just shared the link with you there. Um, we are going to be running some uh, some short courses. Haven't exactly decided on the format and so on yet, but um, we're planning on running some short courses around sort of the practicalities of change making, which will, um, how do you identify where you can be effective? How do you start engaging people? How do you bring people with you? So um, that we'll probably be working on them over the summer and running something something in the autumn. Um, so if you, in fact, if you're interested in that, um, if you go to the sustainability leadership page, even if you're not interested in the sustainability leadership network, go to the very bottom of that and you can sign up for our newsletter. Um, and among other things, we'll, um, let you know about the let you know about that when it comes or indeed just email me and um, if you just want to find out about that when it happens and not get our other newsletters yeah that's fine too um, so i'll share my share my email as well and yeah i think that's anything else i needed to say Gemma. was that it i think yep cool thank you very much everybody um really lovely to see so many people from different sectors if you do have time in the chat to fill in our poll we'd really like to hear some actions that you're going to take um having heard um the webinar today actions that you'd like to take that uh, to become a naturally inspired change agent um please pop something in the poll so um we can start to to create a bit of a movement here and thank you very much to our brilliant speakers uh, and the great work that you're doing um, we hope to see you again in our upcoming webinars please please um keep in touch on the green minds website thank you very much have a lovely afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.